Have you ever wondered, what makes your bones and teeth so hard? So much of your body is soft tissue, and you've probably heard that 98% of your body is water. Well, that number is actually wrong. In fact, on average, humans are about 70% water. But that's beside the point. Bones and teeth contain very little water and are incredibly rigid. Why? What is it that makes them so hard? The answer is minerals. In particular, a mineral called apatite, to be a little bit more exact. And note the spelling, A-P-A-T-I-T-E. There are many different types of apatite minerals. In fact, we say that there is an apatite mineral family. We also call this the calcium phosphate, or simply phosphate mineral family as all of the minerals contain calcium and phosphate in addition to other elements. Your bone primarily consists of collagen. Collagen is not a mineral. It's a fibrous protein that makes up living, growing bone tissue, a framework. Your body adds appetite minerals to this framework to add strength and to harden it. So suffice it to say that minerals are an important part of who you are. You need minerals. Recall that minerals are solid, naturally occurring compounds, and that each mineral has a unique species name, chemical formula, and crystalline lattice structure. The compound described by the chemical formula repeats itself over and over again throughout the mineral structure. The study of minerals is called mineralogy. So far, mineralogists have discovered over 2,000 mineral species on our planet, and they continue to report more species every year. These thousands of minerals species display a wide array of observable properties, such as their crystal color, geometry, and hardness. Diamonds are the hardest mineral on earth, even though they consist of only one element, carbon. The hardness of each other mineral on our planet is determined with respect to diamond. We can measure mineral hardness, the ability of a mineral to resist being scratched, by using an instrument called a sclerometer. This instrument, in essence, measures the width of a scratch made by a diamond. Although sclerometers are very useful, geologists tend to report and measure mineral hardness using something called the Mohs scale of mineral hardness. It's a qualitative ordinal scale, meaning that the values on the scale are not measurements. Instead, they are indications of where a mineral ranks in terms of hardness. Diamond, not surprisingly, is located at the top of the scale. It has the highest value, 10. Talc, the softest mineral, occurs at the other extreme end of the scale. Talc is so soft that you can scratch it with your own fingernail. Talc has a Mohs hardness value of 1. But what are the most important minerals in the field of historical geology? Certainly, opinions may differ, but in my opinion, there are only a handful of minerals that are necessary for understanding the geology of our planet at an introductory level. Incidentally, these minerals are also very helpful for understanding the basics of mineralogy. Let's start our discussion with Bridgmanite which is probably the most common mineral on Earth. I say probably because we cannot know for certain, as it exists at high temperatures and pressures deep in the Earth. In fact, the only accessible source of Bridgmanite on Earth is meteorites, space rocks that have been floating around our solar system since the planets first formed. 
Uncertainty arises when you think about just how deep in the earth that humans have actually gone. After decades of work, geologists have learned that the earth, like an onion, consists of many layers. These layers can be divided among three main levels, the core, the mantle, and the crust. These layers differ in thickness. The crust is very thin, generally around 20 miles thick. The mantle and core, located deeper in our planet, are both hundreds of miles thick. We live on the crust, the Earth's outermost layer, the peel of the onion. These levels differ in their chemical composition and physical or mechanical properties. They can also be further subdivided. For example, the core, which is about 1800 miles below the surface of the Earth, consists of a solid inner core and fluid outer core, both probably consisting of iron and nickel. The mantle can also be subdivided into inner and outer layers. The depth of the mantle varies from place to place across our planet. Where the crust is thinnest, the mantle is probably around 20 miles deep, maybe more. Now consider this, the deepest mine in our world, the Mampangan gold mine located southwest of Johannesburg in South Africa, is probably the deepest spot that humans have ever physically gone into our planet. It reaches an outstanding depth of 2.5 miles. Under the weight of all that rock, which creates heat and pressure, the mine gets as hot as 140 degrees Fahrenheit. To make it bearable for miners, they must pump in an ice slurry from the surface and use fans to create an air conditioning system in the subsurface. Oxygen is also a problem and is short to supply. Yet, for as deep as it is, the mine reaches no more than one-tenth of the way through the crust of our planet. The mantle is still a long way off. The deepest hole ever drilled into the Earth is the Kola Super Deep Borehole, a 9-inch tube that was drilled by the Soviet Union downward about 40,000 feet, or about 7.5 miles. It is an outstandingly deep borehole, yet it made it only half the distance to the mantle, where most Bridgmanite is probably located. For now, geologists are left to theorize about the rocks and minerals that exist down in the mantle and core, like Bridgmanite. Closer to the surface, we know much more about the minerals that make up our planet. The most common minerals in the Earth's thin outer crust are feldspars and quartz. Feldspars, like apatite, make up an entire mineral family. All of the minerals consist of silicon, oxygen, and aluminum, along with potassium, sodium, and calcium, depending on the exact mineral. Quartz consists of silicon dioxide, which is also known as silica. As these names suggest, quartz consists of repeated units of one silicon atom and two oxygen atoms. Quartz is a major component of most sand. It is not surprising then to learn that glass and mirrors also consist of silica, as those things are made by superheating sand. But why are quartz and feldspars the most common minerals in the Earth's crust? The answer is complex, but it boils down to two main reasons. For the first reason, we have to go back, all the way back to the beginning, to the formation of our planet. The Earth formed from material left over from the creation of our Sun. 
This space dust orbited the sun just as the planets do today. And over the course of geologic time, the dust began to collide, aggregate, and coalesce under the influence of gravity. Under these conditions, where there was many high pressure collisions, the dust began to heat up and from it emerged a hot molten mass of material, which would ultimately become our planet. As the molten material began to cool, heavy elements like iron and nickel sank under the influence of gravity to the center of the planet, where they now make up the Earth's core. Lighter elements like silicon and oxygen were displaced to the surface of the planet, where they now occur in the quartz and feldspar minerals of the crust. The other reason that quartz and feldspar are probably common in the crust is because that they are hard minerals. At the very least, they are harder than many of the other minerals found in the crust, like calcite. Because these minerals are so hard, they aren't so easily destroyed. They are made to last. A few other minerals are relatively infrequent in the crust, but very important for historical geology nonetheless. Calcite and aragonite are important, not just for Earth history, but for understanding life on our planet today. These minerals make up a calcium carbonate mineral family. In both calcite and aragonite, the basic unit consists of one calcium, one carbon, and three oxygen atoms. They are identical in composition. Although calcite and aragonite are identical in composition, they have different crystal lattice structures. This is an important distinction as it affects not just their observable properties, but also their stability. Aragonite is considerably less stable than calcite. Over geologic time, we see that aragonite is naturally converted into calcite. This phenomenon helps to explain why calcite is so common in the Earth's crust and why aragonite is so rare. Most of the aragonite on Earth has been transformed into calcite over time. Why are calcite and aragonite important minerals in historical geology? There are many reasons. Limestone, a type of sedimentary rock that is widespread in the geologic record, consists mainly or entirely of calcite. Perhaps more importantly, calcite and aragonite are the most common minerals found in fossils. Students are often surprised to learn that the most common fossils are not dinosaurs or anything else that lived on land. The most common fossils are seashells because they are common, abundant, and stand the best chance to be fossilized. Calcite and aragonite serve the same purpose that apatite serves in bone. The marine organisms use calcium carbonate to strengthen and harden their tissues. Indeed, calcite and aragonite are the most common minerals for marine animals that produce shells. Clams, bivalves, gastropods, snails, and coral all produce hard shells made of calcium carbonate. Coral, in particular, are heavy biomineralizers. They build absolutely massive reefs by secreting calcium carbonate minerals from their tissues. That said, calcite and aragonite are relatively soft minerals. You can scratch them with pennies, knives, and even pieces of feldspar and quartz. As you further explore the concepts of historical geology and mineralogy, you will become more comfortable with the skills needed to identify minerals. And you'll almost certainly learn about a variety of other minerals, which we haven't covered here. Who knows? There are so many opportunities for discovery in mineralogy. You might even discover your own new mineral species one day.